I'd like to direct your attention to the book of 1 John chapter 2. Our text this morning is 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. I'll begin by reading these verses to us. Listen now to the word of the Lord. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your good word. Thank you for these words inspired by the Holy Spirit and given to us. We pray, Lord God, that we would receive them for what they are, the very words of God. With that in mind, this is how we will approach your word. Humbly submitting to you, our God. Eager to know what these words mean and how they should affect the way we think about ourselves and you. May these words change us. May we be helped as we meditate on these words to see how we ought to live as your people. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The Christian life is a life that's centered on confidence in Jesus Christ. That's why we seek to center ourselves on the gospel. Jesus Christ is sufficient. His death on the cross in your place is enough. He can save the worst sinner. And Christ's life, or Christ's work in us, is life altering. We are born again, we are not what we were before. We are new creatures. Importantly, though, we don't make ourselves new creatures. Christ's work in us makes us new creatures. Therefore, Christ changes us. God changes us. It's the work of God. And these two go hand in hand. Your salvation and your holiness. To use the theological terms, we might say your justification and your sanctification. But it just is a way of saying you, you being saved is from Christ. And you becoming like Christ is from Christ. John Owen has this great place in uh, the death of death and the death of Christ where he explains that God's intention for you when Jesus died on the cross was for you to be holy. And he makes his argument out of two verses from the Bible in particular. One is Titus 2.14, who gave himself, this is Jesus, gave himself, For us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let me highlight again some important words you should be seeing here. Christ gave himself to purify for himself a people who are zealous for good works. So when Christ died on the cross, he died on the cross, yes, to wash away your sins. He died on the cross to make you a person who is zealous for good works. He bought that with his blood. Or Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. First, we read that for husbands, and yet what does it say about Christ? Christ loved the church, gave himself up for, died for her, that he might sanctify her. And so when Christ died, he bought the forgiveness of your sins, and he actually bought your sanctification. 
So Christ's purchase of our redemption and sanctification on, on the cross is understood then, not just being something that's secret and inward, secret and inward, something that only you know about, you know, oh, I know I'm a Christian. I know you might not be able to tell, others might not be able to tell, but, but I know that I am. It's not just merely an inward experience that m- makes no difference in your life. Rather, it's outward. It's obvious to others. And again, I draw your attention to John 13, 35. All people will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. The sanctification that Christ bought with his own blood is the kind of change in you that will be obvious to outsiders. And this close connection between our right standing with God on the basis of Jesus, or our justification, and God's working in us to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ, that is our holiness, these, these two go hand in hand, and it leads us to understand what John is all about here in this book of 1 John. John wants his readers to be confident, and he wants their confidence to be in Christ. And so, uh, it's, and this is our basis, first, in a Christ that saves us, though we are sinners, and then secondly, a confidence in Christ who is sanctifying us, doing the exact work he intended to do when he died for us on the cross. He's sanctifying us. Even though we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven, God is at work sanctifying us, and we should be able to see it. And your confidence in both, in your salvation and in your sanctification, both are in Christ. That's what we're going to look at today. The second emphasis, then, confidence in a sanctifying Christ, is the best reading on what John is up to in this book. Much of what John writes about is evidence that new birth has actually happened. This is how you'll know that you're really a Christian. This is how you'll know that you've been born again. And mixed within this are warnings about uh, uh, keeping yourself from sin and keeping yourself from false doctrine. And if this book is read apart from the gospel, what you'll do, if you, if you read this book apart from the gospel, is you'll find yourself stumbling into works salvation. You'll find yourself reading these things. This is the way Christians will live. And you'll say, okay, well, I'll just make the, I'll just make the fruit happen. And never mind whether or not I've really been born again, I'll just look like a born again person. Yet read through the lens of the gospel, these warnings and these proofs are read in an entirely different way. Not as the way that you become a Christian, but as the way that a Christ redeemed and spirit empowered person lives their life. John's desire for you and my desire for you is that your confidence in Christ will cause you to rest in him for your salvation and rely on him for your sanctification. You're going to become more like Christ. You're going to have to have Christ at work in you. Don't rely on you for you to become more like Christ. Rely on Christ for you to become more like Christ. And after all, this matches one of John's reasons for writing. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. John's writing so that they won't sin. And he wants them to be more like Christ. And again, this will only come as they rest in Christ. So John is addressing Christians. Now, this is um, a, I don't know if it's a very long section, but it's a longer section than I normally have, telling you how I came to the conclusions I came to in my text. So here goes. John's writing to Christians, and he explains his reasons for his conclusions. We'll get to them soon. Yet he's writing a book, and he's, he's got this little section here, and this section here has things in it that are really describing all Christians. So when you read verses 12, 13, and 14, he's writing things that are true of all Christians. I think that's the best reading of this text. And he knows that those he writes to are true Christians, or many of them are true Christians. Yes, they live in the midst of those who believe false doctrine, yet by and large he thinks his readers are Christians, and he wants to address them as Christians. And so if he were talking to you, he wants you to say, I want you to know that you really have been born again, and he talks about the fact why he thinks that they are born again, and so we want to talk about that today. And before we jump into this text, though, again, we want to handle a few things that the commentators love to talk about. And I don't know if you love to talk about it, but you may notice it when you read it. So here goes. One thing that happens in the section is he says, I write to you three times. And then he says, I wrote to you. Why does he do that? Three times, I write to you. And then three more times he says, and I wrote to you. And you're like, 
And each time he addresses the same three groups of people, children, young men, and fathers. I write to you, children, and then a few verses later, I wrote to you, children. I write to you, young men, I wrote to you, young men. I write to you, fathers, and I wrote to you, fathers. And why does he do that? At the end of the day, I don't exactly know why, except perhaps he means to emphasize the fact that the message that he writes is consistent. He's not writing a different message. He's, he's consistent in his message and perhaps it's also a way of emphasizing. He addresses children twice because he wants to emphasize what he's saying. If I say something once to my children, that says one thing. If I say it again, it might mean that they didn't obey the first time, but it might also be a way of emphasizing what I said the first time. And so that's sort of the way that we should understand that. The next question we have to ask is, is he addressing two groups of people or three groups of people? Is he, is he addressing children young men and fathers as three groups of people, or as children, an overarching group, everybody that he writes to as a child. That's the way he's been talking in this book. I write to my children. My children, he, he oftentimes does that, and therefore he just has two other subgroups. Those other two other subgroups are the young, peop, young men and the fathers. So is, is children the overall structure for everybody, and young men and fathers the two subgroups? The next thing we have to ask, again, this is maybe more than you want, but here goes, is why does he talk about these different groups? What, what's the purpose of talking about? Why is he addressing children and young people and fathers? Why does he talk about three groups? And the most one common way of understanding this is he's talking about spiritual maturity. And that kind of makes sense, right? Children are really immature. Young men, they're a little more mature. Fathers are quite mature, we hope. And what he's talking about then is spiritual maturity. That, that could very well be true. I, I want you to be clear that that's actually as at least biblically true. It's biblically true that in any church that, you, that we come to, you're going to find people that are very spiritually immature and people that are quite mature. And this idea comes up in the scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not able to receive it. Right? These immature people, you've been there long enough, you should be able to handle me, and yeah, I'm just going to give you milk because you're immature. Or again, Hebrews 5, 12, by this time you ought to be teachers, and yet some of you need to hear the elementary principles again. So again, it could be that what he's, up, up, what he's about here is ba basically saying some of you are immature people and some of you are mature. And if that's the way he's talking, what he's basically saying is um, some of you are immature and we want you to become more mature. That's a, that, that would be the best reading of it. He's, he's saying, in a church in which I'm talking to you about sin and whether or not you're Christians, just know some of you are going to be immature and some of you are going to be more mature. And if you're immature, perhaps we would say then, we'll expect you to probably be less mature in your faith and perhaps sin a bit more. And yet if you grow, reach a level of maturity, if you're like the fathers, then your theology is probably stronger and you probably sin less. And that will help you read this passage when it says... Well, you know, don't sin. It'll set your expectations. If you're a young Christian and you find yourself sinning more than you want to, you go, well, I mean, not that it's okay, but, you know, I'm, I'm young. I'm young in the faith. And, and in time, maybe I'll sin less. Again, that's a good reading. Great sermons have been preached on that, and yet I'm not exactly sure that that is the right way to understand this text. And so I'm giving you a longer background to say you may have heard several sermons on this. I think the better reading is what he's saying is, uh, he really, when he talks about young people, he's really talking about those people who are of a younger age. And when he talks about the fathers, he really is talking about people of older age. That is another way that the scripture talks about. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, or a younger man as a brother. And again, that's, that's speaking to the actual age of the person. And I lean in the direction of this for a number of reasons that I won't go into now, but we can talk about after the sermon if anybody's interested. So in this passage, John is talking about things that I think every statement here is true of a Christian. If you, if you like to hold on to the immature and mature, then I would say that, yes, sometimes these would be happening in, in, in small forms in some people and in more significant forms in others. And yet every statement in here is true of all Christians. 
And as he's writing to these people saying, I want you to live this way and not that way. I want you to live mature Christian lives and not immature Christian lives. I want you to walk with the Lord and not walk in, in darkness. What he's saying to them, first of all, is, by the way, I know you can do this because I know that you're saved. And in a real sense, if you don't know that you're saved, it's going to be hard to walk in a holiness. Because you'll feel defeated from the get-go. And so John is eager here in this section to say, I know that you've been saved, so I know when I ask you to walk in holiness, by God's grace it can really happen because you're really saved. And then he points to the basis of their salvation and says, I know salvation has come to you. I know it has happened. And so when I ask you to walk differently, I know it can happen because God has saved you and he saved you to live differently. So John means for them to be encouraged here in this text. Let's look here then at the three reasons, at least three things in this text that we see. First of all, these are true Christians, and they're true Christians because their, sa- their sins are forgiven for his namesake. That's verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. Now, this is in keeping with the book. This book so far has been telling us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And in another place, he says he is the propitiation for our sins. Or even in another place, he says, in this is love, not that he loved, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Again and again, John is pointing to what saves them. And when he says what saves them, he talks about Jesus. What Jesus has done. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose again on the third day. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross. And I want to tell every one of you, if your sins are forgiven, it's only because Jesus died on the cross. If you're trusting in something else for your salvation, that you're not as bad as the next person, you're not as bad as your neighbor or your coworker at work, then if that's what you're trusting in, you're trusting in the wrong thing. Your sins are not forgiven because you're good. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross or they're not forgiven at all. And so again, John points here to the gospel and says sins are forgiven because Christ died. Sins are forgiven because Christ rose again. Jesus Christ was our substitute. Our sins were put, laid on him. Our punishment was laid on him. And his righteousness is given to us. And on this basis of what Christ did for us and apart from us, we are saved. In this book, many, there are many pointers to the fruit of salvation, right? The fruit of salvation would be things like you'll keep his commandments or you'll love God or you won't love the world or you will practice righteousness. But before we get to those things, we first need a firm anchor. You need to know that your sins are forgiven and the firm anchor for your soul is Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ died on the cross, then your sins can be forgiven. His death covers your sins. You fail to live up to his standard. You fail. I fail. We all fail to live up to his standard. And yet, even though we fall short of his standard, Christ covers our sins. Christ gives us his righteousness. You are saved because Christ died. Or anyone who is saved is only saved because Christ died. Secondly, he says that, I know that you're a Christian because you know him. He says this three times. Three times he says, I know you're a Christian because you know him. First it shows up in verse 13 twice. He says, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. At the end of the verse, it says, I write to you children because you know the father. And then at the end of verse 14, I write to you young men, dropping down to, uh, I'm sorry, I write to you fathers again at the beginning of verse 14 because you know him who is from the beginning. So two times is a reference to knowing him who is from the beginning, which is Christ. In another place, to the children, to all of them, he says, because you know the father. Both of these address those who are somehow in fellowship with God. This is another emphasis that John has in his book. John in his book wants to say, I want you to have the most wonderful thing that God could ever give you. 
I hope you want to know what that is. I want you to have the most wonderful thing that God could ever give you. And he says, I'm gonna, I want you to have, chapter 1, verse 3, I want you to have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the, that's the gift of the gospel. What you get when you're saved is fellowship with the Father and the Son. This is greater than anything else God could ever give you. It's better than a free ticket out of hell. It's better than a mansion over the hilltop. It is fellowship with the God who is joy, who is nothing but joy, and has own, is, it's been your only source of joy. Any good thing that you've ever had has come from the Lord. Any joy that you have is a gift from God. He is a joy-giving God, and your joy comes because you're in right fellowship with him. And apart from him, you will know peaks of things that you call joy, but it's not true joy. And ultimately, you will find yourself separated from him, in which you're separated from the only source of real joy. That's what hell is. And so, John in this section, when he says... You, you know him. He says you know him because you have fellowship with him. You've been united to him by faith in Christ. And again, it points back up to your sins are forgiven for his namesake. But because your sins have been forgiven for his namesake, your sin, sin no longer stands between you and God. And you have fellowship with him. You have joy in him. And you know him. You know the one who's from the beginning. You know the son. And you know the father. You know the one who sent his son so that you could be reconciled to him. And so he says, I know you're a Christian because you know God. And again, you know God points to the fact that you have fellowship with God. And again, this all only from Christ and not from you. You don't put yourself in fellowship with God. God puts you in fellowship with himself. He saves you through Christ. You don't make yourself good enough, so he'll say, okay, I think I'll be your friend now because you, you, you were a bad person and now you're good and because you've made yourself good, I will hang out with you. That's not the way salvation works. You, you can't make yourself good enough for God to want to have fellowship with you. Your sin is separating you from God and only Christ coming in and washing away your sin can make you have fellowship with God, can restore your fellowship with him so that you can have a right relationship with him. And so again, he says, I know that you're saved because your sins have been washed away by Jesus Christ. I know that you've been saved because you know him and you know him only through Jesus Christ. And thirdly, he says, I know that you're saved because you've overcome the evil one. This happens in verses 13 and 14. Verse 13, I'm writing to you young men because you've overcome the evil one. And again in verse 14, I write to you young men, here's a couple more phrases, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And then finally says, and you've overcome the evil one. So again, there's an overcoming of the evil one. If you're a Christian, you've overcome the evil one. Well, how did that happen? Did you just one day figure it out? I finally figured out the devil's trick and I don't fall for it anymore. You may tell you the trick. Is that, is that how it happened? You overcame the evil one because you outsmarted him. Is that what happened? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You can only overcome the evil one because your slavery to the evil one was broken by Jesus Christ. Romans 6, beginning in verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, listen, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin... For one who has died has been set free from sin. In Christ, you are set free from sin. Before Christ, apart from Christ, you are the slave of sin. You will do sinful things. You will follow the leading of the devil. And you won't outsmart him. You won't break yourself free. But don't worry, you don't have to break yourself free. Christ has broken you free. Isn't that a beautiful, wonderful gift of the gospel? You are free from slavery to sin by Christ breaking your shackles. 
And now that you are free from your slavery to sin, verse 17 says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Christ not only breaks your slavery to sin, he gives you a heart, a new heart, so that you want to become obedient from the heart to the things that the Lord commands you to do. You can overcome. Don't trust you to overcome. Christ has, brought, has, has purchased you overcoming the devil. And in these three ways, John points to your salvation that Christ bought. Christ bought your forgiveness of sins with his precious blood. Christ bought you knowing him and having fellowship with him. Christ bought you no longer being a slave to sin but can overcome the evil one. Because Christ lives within you. And in all of these things we're beginning to see that Christ saves us and changes us. That's one of the themes that John has in this book. He saves you and he changes you. You're different. You're not a slave to sin. You don't have to do what the devil tempts you to do. And he points to something important, something that we would be, it would be a big mistake for us to miss. And that's tucked here in verse 14 where he talks about how you overcome the evil one. I write to you, young men. He says, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. Well, the first thing I think comes to mind when you think about the word of God abiding in you, perhaps the first thing that at least came to my mind was the verse we prayed over this morning during our prayer, during our prayer time. Psalm 119.11, my word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's like if the word of God abides in you, it's the kind of thing that it, it abides in you. And again, see the connection that John makes. If the word of God abides in you, you will overcome the evil one. Which is just John's way of saying, if the word of God abides in you, you it'll keep you from sin. My word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin. And again, we, we must never underestimate the importance of feeding our souls on the word of God. It will keep us from sin. It will help... It will teach us right doctrine about our own sin and about the holiness of God. It'll help us to see that our sin is not a small thing, but the kind of thing that can only be washed away if the, son, if the blood of the one who is God is shed. That's the only way your sin that you think nothing of, the only way your sin's ever going to be forgiven is if, the, if divine blood is shed for your sins. That's the way it can be forgiven. And so that you... you are trained to think, you know, my sin's not a small thing. That, that thing that I find myself going back to again and again is not insignificant. It'll only be forgiven if Jesus' blood is shed. And without Jesus' shed blood, it'll be my blood. So it makes it impossible that you would think about your sin as insignificant or a small matter. And it would make precious to you the one who shed his blood so that you could be forgiven, wouldn't it? And yet beyond that, I think it doesn't point to, to a bare word of God. It's not just simply mean the, the words of the Bible. I think it means perhaps a little bit, it's a little broader than that. Because he speaks about abiding. And he talks about abiding in another place. Later in chapter 2, verse 24, he says, Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. So, so here in this verse, he says, Let the, if the word of God abides in you. And now he says, If what you heard from the beginning abides in you. And so there's this abiding, but it seems to be broader than just Bible verses. It seems to be broader like what you'd heard from the beginning. And again, it brings up all those things that we spoke about, about Jesus Christ and about the gospel. So it's not just the words of the Bible, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if that dwells in you, a message about Jesus and embodied in Jesus, a, a, a message that changes us and makes us different people. And when we allow the word of God to remain in us, 
we not only intake the sacred text of Scripture, but are changed by it. Again, we dwell on the beauty of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Especially when we talk about His life, death, and resurrection. And again, we are through that, we are born again. We're made into new creatures. And when you are, when the Word of God and the gospel message dwells in you and changes you, you are not weak according to this text, but you are strong. That's also what he says here in verse 14. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God, God abides in you. Again, I want you to see the connection. You're strong because the word of God abides in you. If the word of God dwells in you, if the gospel message dwells in you and changes you, you are a strong person. Not strong because you're strong. A strong because Christ in you makes you strong. Christ changing you makes you strong. So strong Christians dwell in the word and by dwelling are made strong and have become strong and through that they overcome the evil one. In part because Christ has broken your slavery to sin but also because the indwelling spirit lives within you by which you can put to death the deeds of the body. And again all of this comes through Christ. The Christ who has saved them is the Christ who empowers them and changes them so that they live a sanctified life. So this, this book, 1 John, that talks about living differently is a living different, not because you change yourself and you make yourself different. It's you live differently because Christ has come into your life and radically changed your life, and Christ in you makes you live differently. This is why I urge you as we close today to battle your sin by the gospel. Three brief application points. Here they are. Um, we want to we briefly look at three verses here and see how uh, trusting in Christ and our confidence in Christ changes the way we approach some of the verses in 1 John. So let's look at them quickly. Here's the first one. The first one says that your sins are forgiven for his namesake, right? So if your sins are forgiven for his namesake, it means your sins are not forgiven... Because you're a good person. So let's look back at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Well, if you first read that, you might look at that, and you might say, well, if we walk in the light, we can have fellowship, and Jesus' blood will wash away our sins. And you might think, well, okay, well, I want Jesus' blood to wash away my sins. And some people read this to say, well, all I need to do if I want Jesus' blood to wash away my sins is to start walking in the light. That's exactly the wrong way to read it. Right? So you shouldn't read this to say, if I turn my life around, if I make myself walk in the light, then I'll... Then the blood of Jesus will walk away my, wash away my sins. I first become good, and then because I've been good, Jesus' blood will wash away my sins. That's exactly the wrong way to read that verse. Rather, the gospel way to read that verse is, Jesus cleanses me from all sin, so I'm enabled to walk in the light. Again, Jesus first makes the difference in my life, and because he's made a difference in my life, I'm enabled to walk in the light. So it's first the cleansing, it's first the changing, it's first the new mind. And because I have a changed new mind that came from Christ alone, I can walk in the light. Second application point. Verse 14 says, we know him who is from the beginning. And we take that verse and we apply it to chapter 2 verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandment is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The way some people read that says that if I keep the commandments, I must keep the commandments, because if I keep the commandments, then I'll get to know him. It's my keeping of the commandments that lets me know him. I need to know him to get to heaven, so I better start keeping the commandments. And isn't it all works again, isn't it? If I bring myself to the point that I can keep its commandments, then I'll know him. And if I never get myself there, then I'll never, then I'll never know him. And you're, you're always trusting in yourself. And that's not a gospel way to read that verse. Rather, the gospel way to read that verse is this. Christ saved me and changes me. And knowing him makes me a person who keeps his commandments. It's him in me that makes me the type of person that can keep his commandments. 
and even long to keep his commandments because it gives me a new heart. And even though I don't do it perfectly, I won't perfectly keep his commandments and I won't perfectly long for his ways. Sometimes I'll want to sin and I'll sin. But by and large, the pattern of the Christian is a longing for walking with the Lord. And generally, by God's grace and by his help in our life and actual keeping of it, and all of that comes as Christ in us changes us and makes us people who can actually keep his commandments. The solution then to keeping his commandments is not just try harder, but go to the gospel. Go to Christ, and Christ changing you will make you different. Third application point. When you read 1 John 3, 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. What you shouldn't think is, I have to stop giving in to the devil. I have to defeat the devil. I'm the one who has to defeat the devil. Again, you read that passage and you're like, well, if you make a practice of sinning, you're of the devil. Well, I don't want to be of the devil. I better just stop sinning. Right? As if you're, you could ever sin little enough to make you no longer subject to the devil. You can't do it. You cannot change yourself. Again, you, you, you see, you, you, you want to produce the life change in your life that only Christ can produce. And instead, we go to the gospel, we go to Christ, we go to the cleansing blood that washes away our sins. And we trust in him and Christ who has died for us has broken our slavery to the devil. You're no longer enslaved to him. You don't have to follow Satan's leading in to sin. You can present your members as instruments of righteousness, as, as Romans 6 tells us. All because of Christ in you, Christ changing you, Christ making you a new creature. Again, if you find yourself reading 1 John and thinking, I just need to try harder, you're reading this text wrongly. If you're reading this, the book of 1 John and you say, well, if Christ is in me and Christ has saved me and Christ has changed me, then my life will begin to match up to, to the way this, this book describes what a Christian's life looks like. But don't try to produce the effect yourself. Trust Christ in you to change you and to produce those changes in you and through you. The gospel then changes our pursuit of holiness. Without Christ, some may try to pursue holiness or at least try to not sin. But again, this is a way of earning God's love, of earning your salvation. And it will never work. But with Christ... We will pursue holiness precisely because Christ died on the cross and purchased not just our redemption, but he purchased your holiness. And since he purchased your holiness, you will be a holy people. Because that's what he bought for you. He bought your zeal for good works. Don't try to build that up yourself. Look to Christ. Trust in Christ. He will make this change in you. Again, we are accepted by Christ's work. We're made changed by Christ's work. Again, our confidence then must never be in us, but always in Christ. Confidence in Christ does not produce indifference to sin. Right? When you rest in Christ, it won't make, if you're truly resting in Christ, it will not produce indifference to sin. Rather, confidence in Christ causes me to rest in his work for me and in me so that by his power I don't have to sin anymore. As John reminds us in chapter 4, verse 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Let us rest in Christ as we seek to walk as Christ would have us to walk. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you for this text that points us to the basis of our assurance of salvation, which is Christ alone. Thank you for the reminder that Christ bought our justification and he also bought our sanctification, that we should see and expect to see the types of change that John speaks about in this book. We ought to see that it comes not from us, but from Christ We pray that we'll never look to ourselves for our assurance, but find our assurance firmly rested in the completed work of Christ. 
And yet may we not be indifferent to our sin, but may we pursue holiness, even as you call us to pursue holiness. But we pursue this holiness based on the work that you are doing in and through us. We rest in our holiness as you work holiness in us by the power of your Spirit. Thank you, Lord God, for the for the gospel message that saves our soul and changes us. And we pray, Lord God, that we will be changed. Changed not for our glory, but for yours. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.